Good afternoon. Um, I hope everybody's in the right talk. This talk is going to be my rant on um, CloudSec and Vertec and the impact of open source on all those things. Um, my name is Chris. I've been doing this talk giving thing and open source consultancy stuff for the past decade. Over a decade, actually. Um, I'm sorry for the screen that's wobbling. Not your eyes, it's actually the beamer. Um, so, what's my background? I've been doing infrastructure stuff in open source for the past decade. I'm what people tend to call an infrastructure architect. I design and build infrastructures that can survive the 10th floor test. Who knows what the 10th floor test is? I know at least three people in the audience that should know what the 10th floor test is, but nobody wants to reply. Marcel, what's the 10th floor test? Throwing everything out of the 10th floor. Yep. Keeping everything up running. Want a t-shirt? <laughs> yeah. Extra lot. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, the 10th floor test indeed is that you can take any part of your infrastructure, throw it out of the 10th floor, uh, window and be up and running. Um, this talk is actually a rerun of one that I gave at a security firm beginning of last year. Um, those guys didn't know me, so I had to tell them why I should be speaking at a security firm. And well, also almost a decade ago, somewhere beginning of 2000, 2001, I was one of the active contributors to the open source security testing methodology manual. Um, haven't looked back at that for a while, but still. And um, well, the topic is virtualization and security. So some of you might have seen my talk last year about uh, open source virtualization. Um, I once was stupid enough to write a book for Singress uh, on exam virtualization. Don't buy it, Singress stinks. Mm -hmm. And um, I do write for virtualization.com. So what are we gonna tackle today? A bit about what's virtualization, but I I guess we can go that pretty quick. Then we're gonna talk about what Vertsec is. Um, we're gonna debug everything the commercial vendors try to sell us. Um, we're gonna look at what the open source impact is and also a part about CloudSec, which is a step further. So, virtualization. Um, I think I got these definitions from Wikipedia. And <laughs> um, so, this talk is about virtualization and security, and actually, I don't want it to be a talk that I tell everything, so I want to have a bit of a discussion about what you guys think um, when we talk about virtualization and security. So that's when I see somebody with secure pretty written on his forehead at the front door. I try to get him in. So virtualization, uh, you all got the time to read. Um, why virtualization matters? That's a different topic. Um, there's this trend that is coming up that there's a lot of people saying, well, virtualization, why are we actually using it? Because it makes our infrastructure more complex. It has a lot of benefits, but there's a lot of organizations out there that try to push virtualization while it's actually not really a real need. Um, one of the reasons why they claim it, for example, is that it's better for the environment. You know what the green and green environment and green computing is? The green of the dollars of the vendors. That's the only green and green IT. So, yeah, um, it's easy. You can do consolidation, you can save CPU cycles, you can build isolated staging, development, and production environments. But we're Linux and open source guys. There's nothing that we cannot do already with traditional Linux. We can already put lots of stuff in jails. We can already secure our infrastructure. So yeah, virtualization has a lot of good advantages and a lot of features that you want to use. But So there's also a backside to virtualization. 
why is it not a good idea? Well, lots of vendors, typically VMware, Red Hat, Novel, they claim that virtualization will solve your high availability problem. It won't. <coughs> it will probably give you higher availability than what you already have, but it's still not going to solve your problem. Um, they claim that live migration is going to be the ultimate solution, that when one machine fails, you're going to live migrate to the other side, and everything is going to keep on running. Well, there's new features like Remus and um, other tools that are coming up, and there's research going on towards that one, but we're still not there. And the typical issue still is, well, if you pl pull the plug on a machine, what are you going to migrate? You're too late to actually migrate something. Um, other stuff that's, that's dangerous, the vendor lock-in. Hardware vendors claim virtualize because you can then switch your hardware without actually knowing. The only thing that changes is the hardware and the virtual machines from the applications you have installed, they stay the same. So hardware vendors claim, well, we don't give you vendor lock-in anymore, but you get a new one. And the new one, obviously, is the virtual machine vendor. And typically, that's VMware or the other ones. So security is also an issue, which we're going to tackle later. Um, short word on virtualization and open source. Um, what I already told last year, um, if you look at virtualization, it's open source that's actually defining what's going on. They are building the new features. Um, they are leading the development. Power virtualization was developed by Xen Source. Uh, VMware then said, well, let's do it also. Now they keep the features out of the kernel. They, they're not sure. Um, VT support was also developed in Cambridge as the first. Um, Xen and KVM were the first to support it. Other vendors adopted very much later. And wh what you see is that the core of the virtual infrastructure these days is open. Um, the management platforms, the GUIs around it, they are proprietary and they are where the vendors try to get their money. So what's virtualization to me? Well, all of these tools and a lot more. If somebody has a question about which tools, then go ahead. So that brings us to a new term that was introduced like a year and a half ago and which the hardware, which the security vendors tried to call Vertsec. And Vertsec is the combination of virtualization and security. And there's a lot of discussion of what Vertsec actually is. There's three definitions here, and they're pretty much all right. Um, you can look at Vertsec as the tools that are securing your virtual platforms, your hypervisors, your operating systems. You can also look at Vertsec as we're going to secure the guest operating system on a virtual environment, or running security tools within a virtual environment. And there's lots of vendors out there that, that claim they're doing Vertex, but they're doing totally different things. And then, first question that arrives is, isn't virtualization, isn't Vertex just a way for the security people to, to jump on that hype? Because, well, Virtualization has been hyping for two, three years now, and security is something that always comes in last. Nobody has budget for it. Um, I see a couple of people smiling. Aren't the virtualization, aren't the security guys trying to jump on the virtualization hype to, to get some more money from their customers? When I was preparing <coughs> this talk back in February, uh, not sure if it's readable. No, no, it's, it's, it's feasible. Um, this little thing popped in my mailbox. And that's a traditional security company, Tripwire, probably known by everybody, who is going to release a tool that's going to be a virtual, a Vertsec tool. And when I start reading this, it's like, oh, so they are going to put Tripwire on the config file of a VM. And this is a new tool, right? Why should I? This is just marketing crap. But it's not all black and white. So with the introduction of virtualization, there's a lot of stuff that has changed. 
Um, the network stack has changed. When you look at the network guys, they were used to have a cable from their Cisco or from their Juniper. They plugged it in the machine and they had control till the machine and that was their network. If they could secure that, that was okay. With the introduction of virtual machines, the network stack goes much deeper into the physical machines. There's bridges in there, there's VLAN trunks, there's lots of stuff in there, and the network engineers want to have control over that part, and they're not used to not having control there. So there's a border between where, does, where do the system guys come in and where do the network guys come in. Um, that's one part of the network that changes. When you start doing stuff like virtual machine migration, and you have different isolated environments, your VLAN setup becomes much more complex than a typical network. And that's when we start seeing things that we call VLAN spaghetti. And then, well, it seems like the last line on the slides is always dropping off. There's also one other big thing that changes, and that's scale. If you look at a small business environment, they used to have like three or four machines. And with virtualization, they still have three or four machines, but they have 20 or 25 virtual instances. And they probably weren't already good in managing the virtual security on those four machines, and now they have to manage it on 25 machines. So the biggest part that changes is that the scale is going to be a lot bigger. So what might be good reason to virtualize in terms of security? If you have a bunch of old machines, old hardware, Windows, Boxen, um, DOS machines that are still running some thicker software or stuff, um, claim is, well, if you virtualize them, you don't need to worry about the security of them anymore because you can just take a snapshot and restart from previous point. Or, well, security vendors claim that because you're virtualizing them, you're gonna make it much more secure. Total crap, because the application is still insecure. Uh, maybe you have less work to recover afterwards, but you're still going to be attacked. You're still going to have the same vulnerabilities in the platforms. So it's not really that's a good alternative. Virtualization vendors, security vendors claim that, well, network intrusion detection system, they cannot see inter-VM traffic. Um, VMware cannot because you cannot work as open with it as possible, but they couldn't see inside the applications on the same stack before either, so well, what's the difference there? Um, if you have proprietary virtualization setups, it probably is more difficult to get on the machine and do some analysis there, but if you look at the open source versions, if you look at Xen, if you look at KVM, what do we have as a network stack inside is a typical Linux bridging and networking stack. We can put any tool on that stack just as on a physical machine. There's no difference there. Sure it is for the proprietary vendors, but not for the open source environment. The biggest one probably, flux and scale. Virtual machines are typically changing at a much higher pace and a much higher rate than um, the traditional platforms. Um, one of the claims there is that host-based intrusion detection systems, or even network-based intrusion detection systems, cannot follow all the changes <coughs> around. Well, we used to have high availability clusters, and on one point in time, the application is active on one node, another point in time, the application is active on the second node. There was constant flux and change in state there already before. So, if virtualization introduced that problem, that means that before that, the problem wasn't solved either. Um, if you have a good configuration system in, in, in state, your security rules could be in sync with that. So, well, the idea of static security, that was already dead long before virtualization with high availability clusters, with all this stuff, the problem was already there. Virtualization just made it bigger. It wasn't new. How many of you have downloaded a prepackaged VM from some vendor to 
test out the latest whatever because they had a nice image on their site and they gave it to you so you could test and deploy it. Okay. How many of you have put it in production, the same one afterwards? Okay, that's good. Um, usually you get a couple of people saying, well, we put the same image in production. That's an issue, because how do you integrate it with your authentication system? What patches have been applied? It might be a totally different distribution or platform that you use to manage. So people just grabbing images <coughs> off the web and installing them in production environments, that's a security threat. Indeed, you, you, you save some time because you don't have to install it from scratch, but you lose much more time because you have to secure the platform and you have no idea how to manage it. So in a way, they actually kill your time rather than, than saving it. If you look at a typical window shop, how many times do you see an environment where somebody comes in, creates an image, and then from that image, copies are being taken, people are changing stuff, a really fat big image, because we had a discussion earlier today that what some of us these days call an image is a really thin foil, where from there you start building up again. But people really using images that are being copied around, get to another place, some patches made, from that image, a whole forest of, of different versions of a VM um, are being used. We call that image sprawl. It doesn't even only apply to VM, because I've seen stacks of CDs with stuff written on them, a bunch of old Windows images that were still being used in production. Yeah. So. That's image sprawl. You don't know how to manage them. So with, with CDs, and physical machines, well, there's a limit on how many physical machines you have, but the scale problems come back again. And with virtual machines, it's just so much easier to take this one big two gigabyte file and copy it around to the rest of the planet. Um, oops, I'll grab that later. So the bigger problem there does not become how do I keep them in sync, but how do I keep one hundredths of them in sync? And what do you do with virtual machines that have been powered off for two months and suddenly come up again? Um, it's a whole different discussion than just 10 physical machines. So, let will skip one back. This is something that was once again accelerated by the introduction of virtual machines. But if you look at it from a, high, of a, from a large scale deployment infrastructure theory, it's not an issue, because if you're doing large-scale deployments by making a tin foil, a really small image, from that image you start putting up your applications and your configuration management, and you automate all that framework, well, if it's 10 or if it's 100, if the physical or virtual, it doesn't matter. You don't need specific new tools for that. You already have those tools. So Christopher Hoff is one of the deep vertsec gurus used to work for, uh, for Unisys, I guess now he works for Cisco. And his claim last year about, well, it's in, in September, I guess, about what the problem is with virtualization and Vertec is, it's not a technical issue. It's more a way of thinking, the change of mind for people. They have to think about, well, we haven't been automating our infrastructure already, so because of the larger scale, we should probably do that. And it's an organizational and operational issue. It's not a technical one. So this is a slide that probably comes up in about 50% of my presentations. How do you do this? You automate your deployment. You implement configuration management. <coughs> you map your security management tools to your configuration management. That means that if you deploy an Apache, um, there's firewall rules next to the Apache, and those are being deployed with the instance. Um, and if you have those things in place, you're going to go a lot further. So there's this other topic, hypervisor security. Um, there is already an issue out of um, I think VMware had an issue with the hypervisor that was actually vulnerable. Um, there have been some other discussions about other hypervisors. Um, some hardware, some VM vendors claim, well, 
you cannot go from a host machine into its guests. But some claim that two, a decade ago, they launched the E10K and they said, well, no, you cannot go from one VM to another one. It took exactly two months before somebody did it. I don't believe that. It's, you, you can never prevent these things from happening. There's going to be a small buffer overflow in a management stack always. So it's going to happen. It's not something you can protect from. Um, then there's another nice theory. Um, two years ago at three years ago, the NLUG yeah. security conference. Uh, virtualization conference with a talk oh, yeah. with a talk from Jana. And Joanna had a nice theory, and it sounds nice if you look at it. They claim that you can take a physical machine, have an operating system running there, and modify it, change it so that actually there, there's a hypervising running, and the operating system doesn't know. And you can grab control over the machine. Now. They have a proof of concept that claims it, that actually does that. But the requirements you have in order to actually exploit it, the first one you need is root access to the machine. Yeah, well, <laughs> if you already have root access, then you're pretty far already. So, root my access to the host machine or the root access to the host machine? Not on the VM. Not on the VM. So, if you already have root access to the host machine, then all this are off. Yeah. Good one. So the question here is, is this gonna ever be a problem in, in, in a real life environment? I'm not sure. I don't think it's gonna be that of big of a problem. They've been doing research on this topic like two or three years already. It, it might be a problem on uh, on a large farm where you have access to one of the uh, the visualization uh, engines. Because then you can uh, manipulate all the hosts running on that one. So, if there's an exploit in one of your... Yes, but the prerequisite to actually do the exploit is to have root access on, on those devices. So, if you already have root access, yeah. then you can manipulate all the guests, indeed. But you already can because you have root access. So, <laughs> it's a nice way to install a, a backdoor. Yeah. It's a nice way to install a backdoor, but that means that your security was already good in the first place because you already have so much leaks that somebody got root. Yeah, but it's the same it's as root gates and root gates are yeah. thrown to There's a point. So, is this a real threat? I don't know. Maybe. Um, the first real security issue I ran into in, in virtual machine environments was management of a virtual machine platform. Um, Matt isn't here this year, but who of you already knows what OpenQRM is? Okay. Yeah. So OpenQRM is an um, open source data center management tool. Uh, it allows you to have one central storage environment and there's nodes that do PXC boot. They become idle and then you have a management GUI. And from that management GUI you can say, I want to deploy 10 databases, five web servers, and uh, they have to, you can map configuration data. So the database servers need these kind of disks, uh, and the web servers need this kind of bandwidth outside. And then OpenQRM will deploy all those things for you. Now, what do you think the typical security issue with such a tool was? Initially, the identification was based on IP. There was no encryption, there was no handshake. So anyone who could spoof the IP address of the OpenQRM server could actually take control of all of it. Because you know what kind of commands were being used, you knew how to reboot the machine, you could just spoof the IP and reboot all the machines in the network, or scratch them again, or whatever. Um, that was a real quick fix to, to do that. But there's other management tools around, <coughs> and they might not be aware of how easy it is to screw their environment. So yeah, but with an open platform, code was easily found. 
Which brings me to, to VertSec and, and open source. And just a small summary of what open source is again. Um, it's not marketing driven. There's no company writing code and say, well, we have a product deadline next month and we have to sell so and so. Um, it's usually written because there's a need, because somebody wants to fix something, not because somebody has defined a product line and we're going to sell a product that nobody needs. Um, typically, user peer review is more security. All right, okay, this was the leading product. Open source virtualization is leading the bunch. Yet, there's absolutely, to my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, not one single VertSec product around. There seems to be no need for, from the open source community, to write a VertSec tool. Um, so, we had this panel discussion with a couple of VertSec vendors, and when I asked them, well, why is that? Why are there no tools that are in that area yet? Why is nobody else doing that? Well, the, the open source guys are, are lagging, all they, all they do is re-implement technology. Uh, hang on. Would it VT again? Would it para virtualization? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, but open source doesn't innovate. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but the fact that our virtualization platforms are much more open gives us the, the way to plug in the tools we already were using, and we don't need special APIs to talk to because the inside of, of VMware is totally closed where you cannot play with it. You don't need an API to talk to it, so there's no people writing GUIs to the API. We just go in and do TCP dump on, on the network stack. So Christopher Hoff again on, on what Vertex is. And I'm gonna let it read you for yourself. I'm not sure if, if this is still correct, but we'll see that CloudSec is a totally different topic. So we define what VertSec is, and if you then take VertSec and go to CloudSec, then, well, cloud is the real hype today. And what is cloud? Nobody has a good definition. Cloud is infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and all of those software as a service, platform as a service, are part of the cloud. Um, there's only one thing that's bigger than a cloud, and that's IaaS. We know what IaaS is. Well, usually this, but then it would be smaller than a cloud. And we call it Inuit as a service. So. If you look at software as a service security, then there's a couple of issues. It's one vendor, one platform. You would expect them to have a good SLA, and you would expect them to do with software upgrades good, to have a secure application stack. But the question is, do you trust him? Do you trust um, an online CRM vendor with all your data? What's the contracts you have with them? What if they get hacked? How are they gonna? talk to you, how open are they on that? It's a good question. There's no tools you're going to sell there, it's just the question of do you want to deploy there. And then there's, a more interesting to me, um, the idea that you use the infrastructures such as Amazon or uh, Itricity or, or others, and you deploy your environments there. You come in an environment where you have no physical access, you have no real ID about on what kind of platform you're running, who has access to it. Um, so it, it's not your average DMZ, it's not your private network, it's something somewhere. And sometimes you get goes as LA, sometimes it's a local company, but Amazon, I don't know. But is that not uh, more or less the same for your own uh, company and your own personal? You can do something, but you shouldn't first add the complete uh, st uh, staff of a large company for 
the standout man. We know that there are problems here. Mm -hmm. It's it's the same, but it's it's maybe worse because you can fire and you can sue the guy sitting next to you because he's doing something wrong. But if somebody in the states who works for Amazon does something, you're probably not even gonna trace him. You're probably not gonna know. Um, another this potential disaster is that these clouds data center run all on the same hypervisor. They run all on the same platform. And if we find one exploit that can do an exploit for the Xen version that is running at Amazon, we pretty much can crash them all. And what happens this time of the year when Google goes down? It's panic all over. So one of the other things that can happen there is that somebody can hijack a full cloud without us actually knowing it. And, and there's yet another question, which is what has been deployed before you got that virtual machine? And when you undeploy, what's going to stay behind? You have no clue. Uh, there are already issues known with uh, Google Apps Engine that people could get data from previous sessions from users that would have been using the same instances before and that you could get access to the old data. So there, there's a, a relevant thread there. Um, so there's even more changes than with virtualization. Uh, your deployment methods have totally changed. You, you typically have less control. Your scale has changed even more than with virtual machines locally. The fact that you do more dynamic deploy on demand and redeploy. Now, on the network stack, it's not even the discussion between the network guys and the platform guys anymore. It's whose network is this anyway. They don't even ac have access there. Try to do VLANs and all that stuff in, in the cloud. It's a lot more difficult. So <coughs> if you're looking at CloudSec, there's companies around that are going to sell tools. And it's probably much re more relevant to, to, to look at what CloudSec is and at FirdSec. And there's different advice that I want to give there. Uh, well, increase your security as never before. This actually is a place where you can say, well, let's do something about security first before we start deploying in the cloud. Oh, there's one slide missing, I guess. Yeah, there's one slide missing. What's the biggest thing that changed when you go deploying in the cloud? Machine anymore. No, that that's so not a part that controls that one. Then no. that's only a part. Well, the data is stored in the normal, in the normal sense. You don't have direct control of your data, which I think is more dangerous. That's no. not even a real data. No, no, I, I have the same. The biggest change for the cloud is that it's not IT anymore that's deploying. It's the marketing department. It's the business owners themselves, they are just throwing up an application there and technical people like us are not involved anymore and they don't even think about security. That's the biggest threat. That's a slide that's missing somehow. So, first of all, if you have an organization, you should probably set a policy on when do we want to use the cloud and when not. Otherwise, your marketing department will launch a new website in the cloud and nobody will have any security policy to put there. Um, I was going over the list, and the first one, obviously, on the other slide that's missing was put a policy in frame where you don't allow marketing to deploy. Otherwise, they will. <coughs> um, and these are typical guidelines. Uh, increase, secu increase security as never before. Uh, if you can encrypt all inter virtual machine traffic, but then you, you get a lot of more complexity, uh, and you get a performance penalty because you don't know what kind of machines you have. And typically you don't get the most best powered ones, so encrypting all your data might give you a penalty because you need more virtual machines again. And don't store data in the cloud. Don't store data in the cloud you want to have private. Don't trust them. 
you can use it to, to put some temp data in there. You can use it to do some. Yeah. Is it fine already? Yeah. Oh, what, what works there? My sound. Oh, your sound works. Okay. Right, so don't store critical data in the cloud. Don't make early noises. Um, don't put your critical data in there. And, well, the best thing you can probably do is build your own private data center. Build your own private cloud. But isn't that completely contrary to the purpose of the cloud? No. Because because what is the purpose of the cloud? virtually unlimited amount of resources. And now you're introducing the same shit again, basically, because you have to go back to your IT department to purchase more boxes. Mm -hmm. For most of the people, the cloud is not the fact that they have unlimited power because they know what their limits are and they're going to run to limits anyway. But they, the features they want is a dynamic deployment and undeployment. They want to have a set of machines available where they can say, well, we have a peak in performance. We, we know we're going to launch a new marketing campaign, so we're going to need more web servers and database servers during those two weeks. Deploy them. When the marketing campaign is over, undeploy them and use them for other stuff. <coughs> That's what most people use the cloud for. It's not because they cannot afford to buy 20 machines to handle the peak. It's because they, after they handle the peak, they don't need them anymore. They need them for something else, but if they have to go to um, the whole process of acquiring the machine, setting them up, buying them, the whole sales process, that's taking them way too much time. And that's what most of the marketing guys say, well, I want to deploy it and I want to deploy it next week. IT cannot deliver that to me, so I'm going to do it at Amazon. But if IT has a dynamic set of tools where they have 20, 25 machines available to, to tackle those loads, then they're going to do it with their local guys. Yeah, the problem there is that you still need to do the capex. You, need, you still need to buy the boxes. And that's where people try to cut, cut costs nowadays. It's okay, let's go with OPEX only, so just pay for what you use. Yeah. And of course, the, the new model doesn't fit with existing larger companies because they have all their procedures and politics and everything. Uh, but for what you see, what we see nowadays in smaller companies, they don't even have to think about infrastructure anymore because it's just rented. I mean, no, that, that, that's that's wrong. They have still to think about it because it doesn't scale automatically. It doesn't. No, no, I'm, I'm not, but they are looking at it from the application perspective instead of from oh shit, we need to build a server room and we have air blah, blah, blah. You get rid of all those problems. You just outsource those problems, but you don't outsource the responsibility. For those. And then you get security problems. So How about denial of service? Hmm? How about denial of service? If I uh, know that you're renting some VMs in the in cloud somewhere, yeah. what if I rent 100 VMs in the same cloud and boost the load? To that's uh, a really good remark. Um, I haven't thought about that, but that's, well, if you have enough money <coughs> to outbuy the, all the resources of the data center where you're actually hosting, then you can indeed denial of service to somebody else, true. I think the network is an easier target. With a couple of boxes, you can just set up a denial of service that no one wants to buy. You can even take uh, Amazon out if you want. Yeah. But that's illegal. <laughs> so is buying, buying VMs to deny uh, somebody else's yeah, resources is not. <laughs> that's true. So. In uh, fact, the. the, the uh, Hoster will be happy to accept you against you because you're Yeah, but, 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 but this is in a valid offer that it's probably very expensive. I'm Depends. If, if it's only for a short period of time, you can buy 1,000 virtual machines, have them run for one hour, and then afterwards they're gone again. Yeah. I think, I think uh, for instance, for Amazon, buying 1,000 will not bring them down. No, no but. On and the other hand, it's pretty easy. If you get a thousand people or ten thousand people, all by one. If, if 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 you really want to buy the, uh, uh, to, to to get it in the same time frame, well, probably you will be the one who who hits him because the other ones have to, uh, have them running longer. And then they put a cap on their resources. Now, depending on the type of hardware that you're using in Amazon, anyway, you can take you can take certain instances that will not be shared with others. With others, uh, they're actually they're just a complete machine. With the hyperparameter. But one thing that you didn't um, account for is that it's pretty easy to actually figure out who made the payments for those thousand machines. So you can actually easy pretty track. easy track who's trying to hurt you. Yeah. Whereas when you try to attack the network, that's less 
you can buy credit card numbers on the internet. No, <laughs> I think then you will pay more than the one in which you, you try to out, uh, out number. Okay. I'm crazy. One of the statements that struck my eye last week was this one, and that's that the cloud was insecure already, but the security market is there to make money. They're not there to ensure the customer security, and that's, that's so true. Um, but how many uh, security vendors do you know that do, not, that do not sell products? I mean, that's, that's quite a good test, because they they're typically try, try to sell you products, well, which has not much to do with with security. Well, I'm not sure if, if my company is a, is a security vendor, but we, we do penetration tests and we sell services. Yeah. Well, and I think you'll read this every day. The fact is that you say vendor. Yeah. Yeah. Security products are open source. Yeah. But they are not vendors. Yeah, I'm not security on your Apache. So that, that's the whole <coughs> idea. The problem is that the vendors are not the ones we should be listening to. We should be thinking about policies. We should be thinking about um, what changed and how the operational part has changed. But, well, security is still not a product. It's, it's a lifestyle. And if it's in the cloud, <laughs> or if it's in the cloud or in, in a virtual environment, um, it's the same. And, well, I was hoping to have a bit more interaction. Jochen was sleeping, I guess. Um, <laughs> lucky you. Oh, lucky me, no. I wanted to have more interaction, mm -hmm. that's what I said. Why do you have a bunch of t-shirts there to hand out? Yeah. Oh. So my conclusion is pretty much the same as Christopher Hoff, that first of all, there's no real market, um, especially not in the open source area. There's no tools where we just have to think about how things have changed, how scale has changed, how um, automation is impacted in security too. And well, we really have to watch out for FUD. We always do as an open source community, but there's gonna be a lot more FUD on the virtualization area on VertSec and VloudSec than, than we're used to. Well, well, even in open source, I think, we have to watch out for, uh, for quick solutions which introduce good problems and with cloud computing and virtualization computing you have more risks, more attack factors. Because it becoming more complex and complexity is the enemy of reliability to quote down. So I think that there is there is a real <coughs> problem but there indeed is a real problem and the problem is more visible on, on the cloud than on a traditional virtual environment. But it's not a problem you're gonna solve by buying boxes. Yeah. And that's my message to, to you. So any other remarks? What's the whole time to market thing which impacts security? And not just in commercial software, but also in open source software. There is a time to market drive with developers. And then maybe it's a little bit less, but it depends on the, on the team. And the enthusiasm to get lots of people involved in your project mainly depends on what the need for it is and if it's fashionable or not. But have you seen already products starting up in the VertSec area? No, because I haven't been watching it. But you're in the security area, so you should see things happening. I'm right? in the insecurity area. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the problem is it's available with, uh, with the time to market. And I think there is a place for products there because the problem is that the, the teams, the people that are working on this stuff, idle admins uh, working on large database configurations that know of security issues with the way that they're working but they'll still work that way because it saves them time and so that's just daily operation in, uh, when you're doing new deployments and new products and marketing whatever uh, you also have the time to market issue and since you cannot uh, beat security into that team uh, maybe another vector or another uh, way of solving that would, or at least helping them would be giving them tools that are secure by more secure by default, so they can't make the most stupid mistakes anymore. Yeah, um, but it's very unlikely. Yes, actually, people that's just a mentality problem. To, to, to it it's just a mentality problem. 
if you're if you're yeah. if you're if you're, <coughs> if you're a sales guy and you sell a product, mm -hmm. no matter what, if you didn't include security, you're not even entering my business, not even entering my world. What's if I'm going to clients and they have okay, we have that that application that we want to buy and they want to offer us that and they want to do that, it's the first thing I say. If there's no security enter there, it's like the same if you if you someone says I'm going to code a program for you. Okay, where's the source? Oh, you can't have it. Sorry, that's not that's not an application. You can't do that. So it's in fact the problem that security isn't installed and is not included in the time to market all the time is not the problem of the vendors. It's the problem of the users and the problem of the buyers. They are the ones who have to say we want security. Otherwise, we won't do it. And as long as, as, first. as, long as that doesn't happen. You can you cannot complain whatever you want. The vendors will never. How can it. I see if a product is secure? But that's as a normal user. As a normal user, you don't know that you exactly. you need you need the SLAs, you need the the guarantees, you need the contracts, and you need specialists who can say, okay, this is secure and this isn't secure. So what is and the contract with open source software? You don't have one. No, no warranty. But you get the source. Right. But you get the source, yeah. and that's the only hope we have. No. So but even but with vendors, it's it's when they sell something, whether it's open source or not, you have a contract with your vendor. That's the person Which who has to no the, do the security no. in it. Yeah, but no, the uh, software industry is immune. Yeah. I okay. think one of the, the you, can them. you can't even get your money back. I think well, one of the things we can make them responsible back, for security breaches, but the problem is, of course, that conflicts with the open source model because you don't want a tiny developer to become res financially responsible for security breaches. But it would be wise to have some form of well, warranty, whatever, more than money back guarantee, at least to give them an incentive to make stuff secure. But now they, like you, they don't even have the incentive. Okay, it's broken. Yeah, who cares? We might fix it in the next service pack. Don't worry, like it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, get, getting back to the time to market thing, what's the most uh, uh, popular uh, CMS nowadays? Which is open source? Drupal. What's the most insecure software in Drupal? Yeah, but why is Drupal so successful? Easy to deploy. Yeah. Why did it win from all the others? Because it managed to deliver the features quickly. It's also the highest Google ranking, I guess. Hmm? It's high, the highest one ranking in Google. Also, that, that helps. Well, it's probably the last name of the developer, which is mm -hmm. the reason, but. <laughs> but on the other hand, Drupal does have, I think, about once a week security updates on modules they do, they're improving their security so mentality. From an enterprise computing perspective, that means it's insecure because you need updates. I mean, that's something that you also run into, like, oh my god, they release patches, so it must be insecure. No. So my girl is securing that philosophy. Lots of months. As you say, it's a mindset. But the problem is that the security people are still being viewed as an IT in general is a cost center. I mean, we don't contribute to the bottom line of the company because we cost money. Security definitely is in that picture. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, most of the time it works. Most of the time we don't have security. Yep. No do, you, do you have uh, fire insurance on your home? That's one question I always ask. Do you, do you have insurance for your home? Uh, yes. Has it ever burned down then? No, no, it hasn't. So why do you so keep buying for it? Yeah. Uh, that's the same thing with security. You pay for it because you don't want things to happen. It's racketeering. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, but and, it, and, and in fact, uh, there's another difference there because things happen. I have been involved in large scale fraud. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, we even know that it happens. But the, problem is that the mindset only changes after one of those events. and. There are lots of companies that don't even survive that sort of event. Uh, like well, in the US or Canada, when you lose customer data, I might have got a business. Well, uh, even after that, we still were buying uh, software and hardware from the same vendor, which didn't give a solution. That was probably a government agency. <laughs> no, a telecom agency. Uh, so probably uh, a group connection to Goldsport, I guess. Well, they found a workaround, and it was uh, there was a problem in the, in the in the stack anyway, so it wasn't that easy to fix. Yeah, people. <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. It's all down to people. And I don't have to worry about getting a new job for the next <laughs> no. thirty-five years. <laughs> well, it might change a bit, but okay. Well, Thanks. thank you for uh, your discussion.